when one thinks about justice, one thinks foremost about the rights of the individuals. I will explain you during my speech that it is much more than that, but let me start with the rights of the individuals, and let me start with this situation which I found as the first justice commissioner in the history of the European Union, actually, uh, a justice commissioner who uh, two years ago arrived and there was no uh, directorate general. I had to build it up from scratch. Um, there are many women here. Uh, I took the best available on the market. I have 60% women in middle management and 80% women in top management. Okay. Taking the best. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm not going to speak about uh, women on board today, uh, although it is also a question of justice, but most of all a question of uh, economy. But about the rights of the citizens. Now, uh, in all our member states, we have created justice systems, some over decades, some over hundreds and hundreds of years. They are part of us. They have grown. And they are self-sufficient, most of them. But what if you cross the borders? What are the rights of the individual? How the justice is following them? And that is exactly the responsibility which I got uh, under the new Lisbon Treaty. So not to mingle into your justice system in this country, or in Luxembourg, or in Germany, or in Spain, but to build bridges between the justice systems so that justice is not forgotten the moment on a citizen crosses a border. I started with criminal justice because one of the most sensitive uh, uh, moments is when a citizen, let's say you travel in Spain and um, you are taken by justice because you are supposed to have done something wrong. Well, you won't understand what they will tell you and what you are accused of. So you are completely lost because you don't speak uh, Spanish, you don't know the Spanish system. But you are a European citizen who has rights, not only as an Irish, but also as a European citizen. So we had to create minimum rights for the uh, accused people in a justice system of any of the member states. So that you go wherever you want, and if something happens to you, then you have the rights to interpretation, to translation of the main documents, to information what is happening to you, the right to the presence of a lawyer, and so on and so forth. The first decision, the first directive on this has been done in nine months. That is European record. Mm -hmm. Never ever has been a directive done so quickly. Why has it been done so quickly? Mm -hmm. Simply because people sensed that um, we had to move. Uh, there was an, no rights, and we had to fill those rights with the basic rights for the European citizens. And while I was working on those who have misbehaved, or supposedly misbehaved, uh, the accused, I saw that uh, those against whom they had misbehaved, the victims, were nowhere, neither in our national systems very often, nor in cross-border systems. And then I got a very interesting experience. There was a British lady who came to see me, Maggie Hughes. Maggie is mother of a grown-up son, her son went to a holiday on a um, Mediterranean island um, in a, well, I went to, he, he, he went out and uh, to a discotheque, and after the discotheque there was a big uh, fight. Now the son uh, ended uh, in hospital, and Maggie went to the south. She didn't know the language. She didn't know with whom to speak. Mm -hmm. She had no idea what has happened to, his, to her son. Um, she had no idea what she could do with the doctors, with the, with the justice, with the police, and so on and so forth. Now, Maggie came to me, not say, 
Commissioner, can you do something for my son? She said, Commissioner, can you do something that never a mother will be in my position anymore? That was for me a wake-up call. I told this story to the European Parliament and to the Council of Ministers. I presented a package for the victims in Europe. And the first directive on this package, the standing of the victims in a criminal procedure, has been put into, has been decided at European level. Again, in a very, very short time. You see the feeling that we have to do something for people, that a future Maggie um, does not feel abandoned completely, but that there is a recognition of uh, not only the uh, victim, but also the family of the victim, that they need special uh, care. So that for um, now this uh, criminal uh, proceedings. But I saw in the same time also that um, while well, something wonderful is happening, um, Irish uh, man uh, marries a Polish woman and they go to live in Luxembourg. Great. Uh, great until the moment they want to divorce. Uh, now, a divorce is never something uh, funny. Hmm? No. But when it is, comes to an international divorce, then it becomes really uh, very complicated and very painful. So there again, I made an European, made European rules on which court and which um, uh, law applies in such an international um, divorce. And when I had already started that, I ta tackled also successions because people happen to die in a country which is not their country. And um, then the law of that country applies on successions and nobody knows. So all this we have to take in hand in order to make the life of the citizen a normal life wherever they go in Europe. They have to feel at home. And they know, have to know that they have basic rights. I could speak two hours more about everything we're doing for the rights of the citizens, but then uh, I wouldn't come to the second element of um, my um, introduction. Namely, justice can, of course, be used for the rights of the individuals, but it can also be used for the economy. And most of all, in a situation I do not need to explain you, what's going on in this country and in other countries, we have to do everything that our justice systems help the economy, help the companies, develop the internal market, eliminate the barriers in the internal market, because the internal market with the 500 million um, potential consumers is a real wealth. At our fingertips, we got it there and we don't use it. Why? Because we have not eliminated the barriers. So it's becoming very difficult, mostly for SMEs, to go uh, cross borders. So I have made a special chapter, Justice for Growth. And this morning I was speaking with your Taoiseach and during the Irish presidency, Justice for Growth will be one of the highlights of the Irish presidency. So what are we doing? in that context. Easy things, like for instance, uh, reforming the so-called Brussels I uh, regulation. Um, the, the Brussels I uh, foresees um, that a judgment in one country in um, commercial cases is automatically recognized in the second country, when there is a cross-border um, dispute. Now, this automatically is not so automatic because today you have a very costly exequatur procedure where courts have to come in and lawyers make a lot of money and in the end uh, we lose a lot of time, a lot of um, expenses and there is full of red tape. So in 95% of the cases, this exequatur is an automatic thing, there's no problem. So why to make problems in 95% of the cases when there are only problems in 5% of the cases? Concentrate on the 5%, eliminate the exequator, and leave the 95 um, quiet. Mm -hmm. So that is justice 
for growth so that companies feel comfortable to go cross-border, to commit themselves uh, cross-border. Uh, um, 47 million euros uh, per year um, are uh, going to be um, épargnés. Uh, saved. Saved mm -hmm. uh, for main, mainly uh, as a means. Um, and then uh, the European uh, Common Sales Law. Now, all member states have a very concrete sales law. Um, this sales law is always chosen or not chosen by the contractors. Contract law is free to be chosen. You can make a contract here in this country and choose, and choose the uh, contract law of Luxembourg. I don't know why you should do that, but uh, at any rate, you could. Mm? So it's a contractual freedom. That is fine when you have business-to-business -business contracts. But what about consumers? What about small SMEs who like to sell goods cross-border? Now, small SMEs who like to sell goods cross-border have at each time to apply the consumer rights laws of the country they sell to. Imagine how expensive, how costly this is. Result, the SMEs don't sell or they choose very few territories in which to sell. Result also for the, the e-commerce cross-border doesn't really fly. Although in this country you are very much used to uh, e-commerce, the European average of cross-border online uh, buying is only 8% of the citizens who do that. Why it doesn't fly? Because nobody has the security that if something goes wrong, it will be cared well. Now, what are you normally doing when you are um, uh, opening the internal market? you go to a full harmonization. That is the normal way uh, European law is done. But there again, I was thinking, wait a moment. Is there a problem with the Irish contract law or with the Luxembourgish one? And so no, there's no problem. Where is the problem then? The problem is if a small company likes to sell outside and if a, a, a consumer likes to buy outside. Now then let's solve this problem without creating <laughs> upheaval to a well-established uh, uh, Irish contract law. And I made, and it's for the first time that this proposal has been done, uh, to leave all the national laws in place, but to present an optional second regime which can be used for cross-border buying and selling only under this regime. To choose, of course, because it can be chosen. Now, 67% um, of the companies, of the small companies in Ireland have said that if such a regime would exist, they would expand their um, business. Uh, so you see, uh, you have sometimes to innovate. Uh, if you see that uh, the normal way of doing uh, law uh, does not uh, function uh, anymore. And um, uh, an another element which is of utmost importance, uh, you are just discussing now on insolvency in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, you are reforming your insolvency law. Well, I have been looking at the European insolvency law and I came to the conclusion that this law is not going to the right direction. Because if there is a problem, it pushes the industry into dismantling. Maybe there is a possibility to maintain this industry, this company, not to dismantle it and to give it a second chance and to maintain jobs by this way too. So let's try that. And another thing which is missing, we have roughly uh, 200, uh, uh, 220,000 companies which go bust every year. And one-fourth of this are cross have a cross-border. They are not only in one uh, member state, but these solutions are not on the table. 
So we have to find a solution for this uh, cross-border insolvencies in order to handle that well. So you see, I'm putting on the table uh, uh, solutions which have to be discussed like everything which I put on the table by the Parliament and by the Council in order to make new European law in order to save jobs and not to dismantle uh, jobs. And then um, something which is going to be very high on the agenda uh, during uh, your presidency, and this is the new rules on uh, data protection. We do have rules on protection of personal data in Europe. Since 1995, now ladies and gentlemen, 1995, that was in pre-internet times. Hmm? Uh, One percent of the population was on the internet and uh, the creator of um, Facebook was eight years old. <laughs> uh, the world has changed greatly since that. And We're all older too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we are still not old. Eh? Come on. <laughs> uh, by the way, I was sitting with her sister Mary yes, in I European that, Parliament, yes. <laughs> uh, and that was a gorgeous time. Yeah. I love Mary. We discovered a very <laughs> yeah. close link. Mm. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, data protection is a rule in Europe since a long time, and it is very strongly linked uh, to the way European citizens view themselves comes out of history. European citizens do not trust companies and they do not trust governments, authorities. Out of history, you can understand. And that is also the reason why, uh, as well in the treaties, as well in the Charter of Fundamental Rights, the protection of personal data is inscribed because it is this necessity for the values, the, the profound values of the European citizens. So if that is so, well, then we have to adapt our rules that they uh, can function in a modern world. And with this um, piece of legislation, I can very well explain also how personal rights and business interests can go hand in hand. What is the situation today? The European legislation of 1995, that was a directive, led to 27 different um, national laws, which are interpreted in a complete different way. Result, patchwork, fragmentation of the market, and most of all our smaller European companies complain. Uh, because every time they want to reach another market, they have to adapt to a new law. And the laws are sometimes conflicting and so on and so forth. This adapting to other laws cost our business 2.3 billion euros a year. 2.3 billion. They haven't done anything. Eh? Mm -hmm. They just pay that for adapting to the different laws. So what I do, I scrap the whole thing. In future, one continent, one rule, one data protection authority for everybody who wants to come to our territory has to apply this rule. So I utilize the form of a regulation, a regulation that is a purely uh, harmonizing uh, method. I do just the contrary what I have done with uh, contract law, you see. This time I do a regulation, scrapping national laws, replacing them by one European law in order to bring an order to this and in order to allow our businesses to develop. But on the same time, the rules on the protecting of the personal data on the, of the individual have to be clarified and have to be made operable. And citizens have to know that they have these rights and that they can demand that these rights are implemented. Now, who is going to implement these rights? If I look now around, they will say Brussels. Well, no. You know why? Because I think that the regulators who are operating on a territory know their people and know their businesses very well. So not everything needs to be done by Brussels. Brussels needs to do the general rule under which everybody operates, 
but then leave the people to operate. So the Irish um, uh, Data Protection uh, Authority will be responsible for companies who have their main establishment in Ireland. But it will do that on basis of a single European law in contact with other national uh, regulators who apply the same law and who might have a subsidiary in their country or who might have a citizen who has complained in their country. So the network of the national regulators to function very well, but the responsibility to be with the national regulator on the territory of who the um, uh, company has its main establishment. So with one piece of law, you achieve two things, opening the market for companies, putting legal certainty also for companies, and um, 2.3 billion euros less costs, and on the same time, allowing the citizens to get their rights. Now, I have not yet spoken in this whole context about the security aspects, because there are also the law enforcement questions and the questions of um, how the police forces uh, operate in order to secure, in, in, in order to guarantee the security of a society. Now, maybe there you need, without eliminating the rights of the individual, because the treaty does not foresee differences, the treaty has one horizontal rule for the rights. But one right is never absolute. When a right touches another right, then you have to equilibrate. And here you have the right of the individual to the protection of his personal data, and you have the right of the society to be protected against crime. So you have to put both in equilibrium, and that is why I chose for this part of solving problems the form of a directive, which allows then the member states to adapt these common rules to the specific needs of their territory. I can imagine that the police forces in this country have a different problem to solve than the police forces in Luxembourg. Mm -hmm. And we should give then this um, to the governments uh, under the control of the European Court the possibility to manoeuvre so that the um, guarantee of security is, um, uh, is solid. Another element, I very quickly uh, come to this because it is an interesting one, because it's the first time that at the European level we have harmonized the definition of a crime. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I am very cautious when it comes to criminal law. Criminal law is very much integrated into the um, cultural diversity uh, of a member state. So you have to be very cautious. And by the way, the uh, treaty does not allow the Commission to come into the criminal law at any level. But the treaty asks from the European Union to protect the financial interests of the European Union. The crime against the budget, so the taxpayers' money, which are in the European budget and which is also misused by some criminals. Now, very often, those criminals operate in different member states, and it happens so that in some member states a crime against the budget is no crime, so they settle there and they are very happy thereafter. Now that cannot be. And that is why I put on the table a definition of what is a crime against uh, the European budget and um, also the minimal sanctions which have to be established in national law. And then comes the second problem, madam. Um, because uh, you are the public prosecutor, aren't you? So you are responsible for this territory. 
Hmm? But your responsibility does not go cross-border. Um, if you want to be active cross-border, you have to agree to do that together with the public prosecutor in a neighboring state. Maybe uh, this public prosecutor is not very interested uh, to pursue that because he doesn't see the real interest, uh, European budget. Hmm? So in the end, not much is happening. Mm -hmm. uh, very much to the advantage to the criminals. And that is why I started the reflections on and what is possible with the Treaty of Lisbon to slowly, slowly set up a European public prosecutor for this special action, not for a crime which is happening under Madame's responsibility in this country, but, uh, I mean, not the crime, the, 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 the solving the problem, but only for the questions of crime against the European budget, so that a European prosecutor, in the end, can make the national prosecutors work together so that there is no hiding place anymore uh, for the criminals. I'm sure you are very much shocked about everything which is going on. And these things are going on now since two years only. They completely change the way justice is done in our member states because there are the bridges and there is a collaboration. And there is, although the independence of the national justice, and I'm fighting for this, you might know uh, the fights I have had on Hungary and on Romania when this independence of the national uh, justice was put in question. <laughs> no way. So justice has to be independent. But justice applies the laws which the politicians are doing, um, colleagues. And so we are doing, together with our parliaments, me together with the European Parliament, those laws, once they are in place, it is on the independent justice to do its job. So I am trying to do my job. I'm very happy that I'm not alone to do it. I have a very strong parliament and a very strong council of justice ministers to help me. And that will change the face of this Europe. It will be, in the end, a Europe of the rights of the individual, where everybody can feel at ease and at home. Thank you. Thank you very much.